Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Taryn Urquhart, and I am the Arts and Special Events Programmer here at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. On behalf of the library and the West Vancouver Art Museum, I would like to welcome you to tonight's art talk. While I recognize that we are all in different places this evening, I would like to acknowledge that the West Vancouver Library and Art Museum reside within the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and Musqueam Nation. We recognize and respect them as nations in this territory, as well as their historic connections to the land and waters around us since time immemorial. I am personally grateful to call the Pacific Northwest my home, and I'm thankful to the Coast Salish communities that continue to protect the natural beauty and animal diversity that surround me every day. It has been my great pleasure to work with Hilary Letwin and her guests tonight to bring uh, this event to your screens. And now I would like to pass things over to Hilary, who's waiting over at the museum. Hilary. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank the West Vancouver Memorial Library for partnering with us on this evening's artist talk. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you and to welcome our exhibiting artists, Rosita Monashirazi and Pari Azar Motamedi, uh, who are both here to talk to us a little bit about our exhibition on currently at the West Vancouver Art Museum under the shade of the lotus tree. Uh, this exhibition uh, includes work by both artists and this evening we're looking forward to hearing from them about their artistic journey and about some of the inspirations behind the work currently here on exhibition until April 1st. Uh, so good evening, Rosita. Good evening, Pari. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Pari, I'd, I'd like to start with a question um, directed to you. I'd like to learn a little bit more about your, um, your life uh, and, and how we came to um, West Vancouver and exhibiting your work here at the Art Museum. Hi, Hilary, and thank you so much for organizing this uh, exhibition and organizing this talk. It's been an honor to exhibit with you and to have uh, my work with Rosita's in the same beautiful space. And I really enjoyed the whole process very much. Um, I uh, was born in Iran and grew up in Tehran entered the Faculty of Fine Arts, Tehran University, the Department of Architecture in 1963. And after graduation from um, the School of Architecture, uh, we moved uh, with Mansur uh, to, uh, to uh, London, England, and I started a master's degree in urban transportation planning and uh, after two years, we got back and started to work in Iran as an architect and urban transportation planner. Um, by the time uh, the revolution happened uh, in 1979, uh, we were working in Iran and uh, hoping to be part of uh, the development of, of the country and to contribute to, to the well-being and in our professions to, to do whatever we could. But uh, it was cut short and with the uh, start of the war in Iraq, uh, with Iraq, we decided that uh, maybe we should think of uh, leaving in leaving Iran because it had become quite dangerous at that time to to be in Tehran. They were bombings and various uh, war related uh, events that were going on, and so we. Uh, came out um, of Iran in 1982. Uh, and uh, I went back to school again in, in London, this time to study urban development planning because 
I still thought that we would go back to Iran at some point. And urban development seemed to be um, something that would be um, a, a project to, to focus on. Um, and low-income housing was a component of that program. But as the days went by, we realized that we couldn't go back. We had two young sons. And so we um, applied and got accepted to come um, as uh, landed immigrants to Canada. And so in 1984, we um, arrived in Vancouver. And at that point, uh, there was a big recession here and really no, uh, no opportunities for work as an architect uh, in the immediate time that we had come. And I was actually very, very depressed because of what was going on in Iran. And I, while I was really grateful to be here with my family and to, uh, to have the freedom and the, the, the peace of, of being here, I still uh, had connections with Iran. And so I had become quite um, depressed, actually. <laughs> and so the, the only way that I could uh, uh, achieve some normalcy in life and to be able to, to function was uh, to have this connection with Iran through uh, the art and yeah. through painting and poetry. So I immersed myself in, in poetry, in Khayyam's poetry specifically, and I started to paint. And what came out from those first several years was uh, my connection to architecture and to, to the spaces of Persian gardens, which were um, very much in my in my psyche, and 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 uh, th those were the spaces that gave me most pleasure when I was there, and so they emerged in my artwork. The, the geometries, the, the the foliage, the the whole architectural space of these gardens. And with Khayyam's poetry, they came together and they gave me this, uh, this time or this space to, to find myself, to find myself as somebody who is displaced, but still related to, to those precious and cherished uh, spaces and still living in the West Coast of Canada and enjoying the nature. So it was really a very, very, uh, very enriching uh, and productive time for me. I probably painted, I don't know, 10 hours a day, every mm. in the middle of the night, I would get up and go and immerse myself in the poetry and paint. And, and so that was the start um, of this process for me and has continued for 30 years now more than 30 yeah the title of our exhibition under the shade of the lotus tree is is particularly important because the lotus tree is a place of refuge a place of solace and and pari that certainly applies to the work that we have in in our exhibition here uh, with our selection of work by you uh, rosita i wonder if you can tell us a little bit about about your artistic background and and your um, journey to this point uh, I think uh, we Iranians are sharing similar stories. Uh, but before that, I would like to thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity and this beautiful uh, exhibition in this uh, very cultured environment. And also, uh, I have to mention that I, I am honored to be with these two women, Perry and you, so smart, kind, uh, passionate and courageous. Uh, this is truly my honor uh, to be part of this exhibition and uh, getting to know you um, in this uh, journey. Uh, about my life, um, I, I grew up in a very peaceful environment. 
<clears throat> in um, in in a city close to uh, Tehran, uh, Karaj with a wonderful climate, um, nice rivers and uh, beautiful nature. And um, when I was in grade two, I realized that I like colors and I like to be a decorator or an artist. Um, but uh, the idea was very vague. But uh, when I finished uh, middle school, I entered graphic uh, uh, art school. And uh, right after I graduated from high school, um, all universities uh, were closed because uh, it was two years after the revolution. And the government closed all the universities due to cultural revolution uh, to uh, change all the uh, textbooks and uh, um, and fired all intellectual and uh, elite profs and so on. The university was closed and as Perry mentioned, um, war happened one year after the revolution. Um, and also uh, the government started to uh, to execute and imprison the uh, the oppositions. Um, so the country was under war. Um, the situation was really dark. Political, uh, social uh, environment was very very dark. And also there was no university for me uh, to go. I decided to. Uh, I, I, I made my parents to accept uh, and sending me abroad. I moved to Germany and I, start, uh, I started university after uh, I learned English in uh, German language in Goethe Institute. Um, I studied uh, communication design there. And then um, I met my husband, who was my roommate at that time. <laughs> and <laughs> so and we decided to move to a country that is more, uh, have more acceptance for multiculturalism. And we decided to come to Canada. Um, I left Iran in 1984 and I moved to Canada in 1990 with my husband and a little son. Um, here I learned the language again and uh, studied uh, at Emily Carr University. Um, first Langara, I got the diploma and then uh, transferred to Emily Carr University. After I finished uh, university in 2003, we moved back to Iran because I, I, I came to to um, abroad just, just because I wanted to study and go back to my country. Yeah. So the idea was always with me. So I wanted to go back. And I moved to Iran in, 19, uh, in 2003 and I stayed there until 2006. <laughs> and there I uh, met so many wonderful people, artists and educators. And uh, I had the opportunity of a study illustration I, I got my master's of illustration in Iran, and I, I think the country is really rich in that. It has over 5,000 years of history uh, of illustration um, from the uh, art on clay, illustrating life of people on clay, carpet, uh, you name it, um, and books and scripts. Um, so uh, I think I was very fortunate to have the opportunity of a study in Iran. And when I moved back, and along the way, actually, I have always been teaching, teaching art. And um, when I moved back and seriously started to teach, uh, I realized the students, uh, usually art students quit after they graduate. After a few years of struggling, they, they, they quit. So that became, uh, something very important to me and I wanted to study further and, and, and get an answer from my question. And I applied for a PhD program at the University of Victoria. Uh, I was about to finish uh, when I uh, got ill, seriously ill, and uh, I decided to quit. Uh, because I couldn't finish my thesis. I was, uh, you know, about to be done, but, you know, all those theory, uh, you know, uh, became kind of uh, 
meaningless at that point when I was very ill and in pain all the time. So, uh, but my wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, supervisor, Michael Emmy, Dr. Michael Emmy, didn't allow me to do that. And uh, he, and actually he, he taught me a lesson how to not quit. Mm. So actually in a, in a practical way, actually. And, and uh, he organized a program and uh, they offered me the Masters of uh, Art Education from University of Victoria. And uh, also I've been teaching at Emily Carr University since 2009. When they started the uh, program of illustration, they invited me to teach there. And since then I've been teaching, working, and being involved with their programs. Hmm. Thank you so much, Rosita. It's, it's such a pleasure to, to work with you and Kari for this project. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about poetry. Uh, you, you both have touched a little bit on the importance of it in your work. Hmm. And it's, uh, it's certainly very present in our project. Uh, and um, it gives me much pleasure to see, I'm, I'm looking out at the gallery right now and I can see all of our label texts, uh, not just in, in English, but also in Farsi. And we've included the poems that have informed your work. Uh, Para, you, you mentioned that, um, that you were seeking solace in, in poetry when you first came to Canada and that that was infusing itself into your work. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, about the poetry that we have uh, included here in the exhibition and, and how on a practical level it influences you. Um, are you taking poems and, and illustrating them in your mind or is there a slightly different process going on? Hari, do you want to speak to that first? Yes, well, thank you for that excellent question. Poetry is such a big part of the Persian psyche everybody recites poetry it's it's a way of communication between scholars and between everyday people in families people uh, would uh, have quotations of poetry if they want to convey something uh, that uh, that it, that deeply affects them so and we have all these uh, you know uh, poets from thousand years ago um, who have given us this wonderful heritage. So it was, uh, for me, there was no, um, the, it wasn't something that I decided to do, but it was something that that was part of me. And, and Khayyam was such a big part of my family's tradition. And my, my father always had a Khayyam, a worn out little book that, that I took with me. Um, and, um, and the lessons of life were there. Uh, my father was not a religious person at all. And Khayyam was, uh, was his, um, his uh, intellectual and spiritual place. And so that was uh, why I started with Khayyam. But, um, and, and it, was, it wasn't really uh, at all the, uh, the surface um, or, or the words of the poem that inspired me. It was the mood of the poems, the, the, the way he speaks of, nature and being in in the moment and enjoying what you have and and uh, not to dwell so much on the things that you don't know and that are beyond you but to be here and present and and um, connect to that beauty and so uh it was for me uh in in for me it was the gardens and i had suddenly come into this city which is a garden, a beautiful, huge garden. The ponds that were in the, in the small Persian gardens is now the Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. and, and the trees, everything. So for me, it was really um, immersing in these two worlds and bringing them together. That was, that was really um, 
inspiring and motivating me to do this work. Um, uh, then uh, in one of our trips to Iran, uh, I picked up a book by a poet who I didn't really know that much, um, a contemporary poet who is now in his late 80s and is still living. Um, and he is uh, Shafi'i Katkani, Muhammad Reza Shafi'i Katkani. And I brought his co collections of poetry to uh, Vancouver and started to read this poetry and realized how he has these layers of meaning in these words. And that the more I read, the more I I understand what what is going on, and uh, and 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 it was a very very different experience because um, because with with his poetry I had lived in in the time that he is talking about and I can read into his his uh, poems what 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 I had lived which was different from from Khayyam's poetry for me. So I started to paint his work. And um, uh, after I had done about 10 or 11 paintings, one day I told Mansur, my husband, who used to travel to Iran at the, that time, I said, you know, this poet doesn't know I exist in this world. And I'm always immersed in his work. Is it mm -hmm. possible for you to find him and show him because I feel terrible about painting these poems without him knowing that I'm doing this. So he um, took these paintings on a disc to Iran and with the translation of the poems in English, because I had started to, put, to translate them into English because I wanted to really understand them and, and putting them into a different language for me was part of the process of painting them really. So Mansur went back and met uh, him through a mutual friend who was a publisher. And he immediately was so uh, supportive of this work. He wrote uh, a letter saying that you can translate all of my work into <laughs> English and, and into paintings. And very soon uh, after that, about a year after that, I was still in the process. I had painted some paintings and, and translated. And he um, suggested that we publish this work in Tehran, which was for me very f too early, really. But they were in such a hurry to, to publish the, the paintings with the, with the translations. And... Uh, uh, I was trying to find a, um, he suggested, of course, that I find a poet who is um, also uh, conversant in Farsi and English and to, um, uh, to ask him to edit my work. So uh, he suggested uh, that I... Um, uh, that I connect with... Um, uh, with an English poet who has translated Hafiz um, and, and very well known. He has a Persian wife. Um, <clears throat> do you remember his name now? I can't. Anyway, he didn't. He said, I have no time. <clears throat> so that, uh, and then in, in, in a conference in... Uh, we were together talking. Yeah, in, in a conference in Vancouver, we were talking with Rosita and I was saying that I have, uh, I have to find an editor for this uh, work, an English speaking editor. And suddenly the speaker who had just uh, spoken about his translation of Rumi's poetry was standing behind me. And he said to me, you know, I can edit your your." Uh, English translations. And I looked at him and I said, um, well, thank you so much. But how, I mean, how do you know what I have done or what I, uh, what I am doing? So he said, um, this is Alan Williams now. He said, 
because uh, Shafi Kadkani was my Persian teacher at Oxford University 35 years ago. So <laughs> that was just a godsend. <laughs> And he wrote a letter to Shafi Kadkani, which I took back. And so that was uh, that was how that part of the work um, continued. And he became the editor, and the book was published, and um, it got an award in translation a few years afterwards. And then I have been painting his work for about um, all these years. I mean, I have probably painted about um just just less than a hundred of his of his poems and then of course i moved into trans into translating and working on the work of sohrab sepehri and mehdi akhavan sales whose work is presented behind you my my interpretation of his one of his important poems and um um you know, I have been extremely, extremely lucky to have this really this treasury of of thinkers and poets who have given us so much, and I could live many lifetimes and work with these and still have more more inspiration and more work to do. So it's just been uh, an amazing. Um, amazing opportunity to work with these poets. It's it's wonderful to hear uh, how this process of translation has has really permeate, permeated your visual process. Um, you're not just translating the, the verses. And I, I loved what you said about how um, <laughs> translating the poems into English gave you a, a deeper understanding of the of the poetry. Rosita, I, I I'd like to speak also about your incorporation of poetry and, and it acting as an inspiration for your work. Um, the main uh, series of works that we have that we're exhibiting by you are of course based on a very important poem, The Seven Valleys. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you worked with this poetry, how it, it, it is similar to the way Pari has in her work and how perhaps it's a little bit different as well. Um, obviously each individual had uh, a specific, a specific ways of connecting with poetry because it's very, very poetry, uh, personal, and especially because it's, uh, it contains lots of metaphors and it goes back to the history uh, of the life of each individual and their observation from the poetry. Um, it, it changes the meaning completely sometimes. Um, but the part that uh, my father was also in love with Hayyam uh, <laughs> is very similar to Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember in 1986 when my father visited me in Germany and I was complaining and, you know, talking about being alone and so on. And it was the time that uh, Mohammad Reza Shajarian um, um, had a, a cassette came uh, out at that time. Uh, he um, uh, actually recited uh, poetry of Khayyam. My, uh, my dad played the music and said, look, we live in a moment, in this moment. Don't think about tomorrow. Let's enjoy the time together. And uh, so uh, poetry uh, in my family was uh, a part of our uh, ritual. My mom also writes poetry um, and they, 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 they've been involved uh, with it a lot. And obviously uh, uh, as a child, uh, as an oldest child, uh, I have been always influenced by a Persian poetry in our household. Uh, but later on, uh, when, when I started to read poetry myself, uh, the idea of self-absorbent and, and also the metaphor actually uh, haunted me the most. Uh, so I was so inspired by finding the meaning behind uh, chains of words. Uh, for several years, when I was younger, I couldn't get it at all. 
uh, but the mystery actually uh, really uh, um, made me uh, look for the magic of using uh, literature in Persian poetry. And uh, along the way, when I was uh, involved with painting, and reading different books and learned about conceptual art, I found out that these are completely conceptual. However, they belong to the time uh, prior to conceptual art, like before, long before conceptual art, you know, uh, came along in, in, in the West. And uh, so I, I learned how to combine them and find meaning through my own life in relation to the poetry that I have been reading all the years. And uh, the, the, the pieces that uh, affect me the most turned into visual form slowly. And um, I think we have uh, the, uh, the poem uh, by uh, Hafez uh, uh, within me in with this shattered heart. Uh, uh, th that's uh, the time that I was super depressed. And uh, it was after 2009, the uprising in Iran. And I felt like I'm away, so I can't do anything. And, um, uh, you know, I, I thought I have to stop painting forever because there is no reason for me to paint anymore. So uh, since it has no use and... Um, so once I started to uh, to make some lines and this poem came to my mind and I realized this is it. You know, you don't go for the poetry. It comes to you because it's so, you know, it's it's I think it's in our DNA somehow as Iranian. Even now, the slogans that, you know, in always they have a form of poetry. They rhyme, you know. And uh, so um, from that time, uh, poetry became um, more, um, not effectively, but, but um, consciously came to my work. And at the work, I, I just work with it, uh, the, uh, the, the story of Seymour. Um, it's the story that came to me uh, right after I came back from Iran, after four months, being there, knowing so many wonderful people, learned new techniques, and also meeting so many young souls that they were struggling daily, you know, um, without feeling that they are intellectual or, or they are fighting for freedom, you know, in their daily lives, um, they, they, they uh, scream for freedom. And uh, when I came back, this poetry actually became so meaning meaningful to me, like the story of uh, rebirth. And uh, so I started to uh, to visualize what it look if all these birds uh, become free. Oh, and, and I was also wondering how, in this dark time, all the, these glitters and bright colors come to my canvas while I'm, I, I'm, I'm in tears listening to news from Iran. Uh, so, and I, I, I think the idea of rebirth and, uh, and the truth in, in the, uh, the poetry of uh, Atar actually made me work this way. So I, I'd like to talk a little bit more, Rosita, about the technique that you employ in the work, much of the work that we have exhibited. Uh, you've used reverse glass technique. And as you mentioned previously, you were in Iran for four months uh, in the middle of 2022. You were there for the summer months. Uh, and um, I'd like to, to hear just a little bit about the technicality of how you do reverse glass painting. It's, it's not straightforward <laughs> and something that I'd love our viewers and our visitors to understand a little bit better. Yeah, um, can you explain how reverse glass technique works? Uh, sure. Um, actually, when I, um, I traveled to Iran, I had a, uh, a, a Tehran tour uh, and I visited um, old houses uh, with a wonderful uh, design windows. The, the part of it was covered with, uh, uh, with paintings and the style was uh, reverse glass painting. Um, at that time, my plan was uh, to learn uh, 
traditional mirror work, which I learned. Uh, but it, uh, you know, in the corner of my mind, what, you know, I was so inspired by those paintings. Uh, after I learned uh, glass work, I, I, I felt like I need to incorporate glass with, the, with mirror work. So, and, and sometimes I need color for my glasses. So, and uh, how can I do that? And uh, I, I accidentally uh, came across a wonderful a master. His name is uh, Mohsan Bani Asadi, who uh, is uh, one of the leaders of uh, the uh, Museum of Reverse Glass Painting. And uh, I, I contacted him and he generously offered me to teach me how to work uh, in this, uh, with this technique. And, I, and he was also, he is a, a, the curator of a gallery in, in Tehran. And after gallery was closed every day, so I visited him there and he taught me uh, different techniques. Um, how the technique works, um, you uh, pick a piece of glass, usually two mils or three millimeters, um, not so thin because it breaks very easily, and um, clean the glass, and then use Rapidograph, which is a, a, a technical pen, which I have it here right beside me. It has a really, really a thin point. It, it, it uh, looks like, um, um, a needle, very, very thin, a point 10, point 15. It's very thin. Um, you clean the glass and then uh, have your drawing ready on a piece of paper. You overlap the glass on top of the uh, paper and start uh, outlining uh, your uh, drawing. So this is very thin, but the traditional way of working with glass uh, is different. They used uh, very thin brushes. Um, thin brushes uh, are hard to use and also at the same time easy to use because it, it has some sort of thickness and it will create a nice border between different colors. Whereas these thin uh, pens, um, they have no borders, basically. You have to be very careful when you want to create borders and margins uh, between the two colors. And sometimes I passed the border and I had to clean my uh, glass with needle uh, to clean the parts that I you know, made mistake. Uh, after you finish the uh, um, outlining, you have to cover your uh, glass with uh, oil and some sort of uh, varnishing oil and uh, oil thinner. Um, leave it for a few days to get dry and makes your lines secure. And then you start using powder paints, which you can see them in here, uh, and or um, oil paint. Um, but I added a uh, glitters, uh, uh, mixed it with oil. Um, and the, the magic of this uh, painting for me is you work in reverse. For example, if you want to make uh, wrinkles for your character, first you do the wrinkles and then you want to create blush. You do blushes and then you put the skin tone. It, it's, you know, it was very difficult for me to reverse all my training and I start from uh, the details first. Um, and, and also the problem is if you make mistakes or you change your mind, there is no way to go back to it. And um, that's all. And then you leave it for a while to get dry. And after a month, you cover the whole thing for the background uh, with uh, white paint and secure the whole painting. It's a very painstaking process and, and quite pretty. extraordinary. And, and I should think so interesting, as you say, to reverse your training and to, to build the surface first and work backwards. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're beautiful works. Um, Hari, we've, we've had a number of visitors ask about your uh, practical techniques as well. You work in watercolor 
Uh, and um, the piece that that is behind me, actually, the, the City of Stones um, is it, is very large, uh, and uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about how you work in watercolor uh, and building up your layers. You you had previously said that the blue sky and the work behind me was an incredibly difficult, uh, consistent tone to achieve. Can you talk a little bit about your watercolor process? Yes, um, thank you, Hilary. Yes, it's um, I really enjoy working with watercolors. And um, I have tried at different times to, to work with um, the other media, um, oil and acrylic, and it never gave me the pleasure of working with watercolor. And what is really for me uh, interesting and uh, exciting to work with watercolor is that it's a medium where you can, you can have a certain amount of control but also there is a lot of accidents that happen and, um, and it's always wonderful to be able to work with these accidents and to accept them as, as a part of this happening on, on, on paper and see what can, what can come out. So it's always like a voyage, like, like a, a, a thing that you are going through at the moment that you are working on, on this with this medium there is there is very little uh, of course there is there is some planning and and control uh, ahead of time but the actual moment of painting is the most important part that that that, that, that giving in to this medium and and see play with it all the time to see what you can achieve with this um, in the beginning, when I worked with smaller pieces, of course, it was it was different. It was uh, uh, more more possible to 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 work with this medium, and there was a lot more control in them. There's a lot more uh, specific geometries that are happening. But as I started to work in bigger pieces, which I loved when I when I started to do this it became really, really challenging, but also very, very exciting. So with watercolor, you have to work on a flat surface. So you have to have these um, uh, large pieces of uh, very thick watercolor paper, which I do stretch. I, I uh, uh, soak it in water and, and stretch and tape it to, to my board so that it's completely flat at all the moments of painting. And, uh, um, to, and then I start to, to work with, uh, with the um, colors and, and um, my, my first, uh, my first um, uh, moment is actually to do the, the, the outline. The outline, um, the architecture of the piece is what I do in, in uh, pencil. But, but a lot of the things that you see is actually happening without any pre-thought and without any pencil. So for example, in the background, uh, the, the painting in your background, all of the, 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 the form of the tree, which I have there, the, the, the the lotus tree is uh, actually my brush. And uh, I use for that specific part of the painting, acrylic ink and, and spontaneous because I can't really draw those lines in paint and try to, to uh, follow the line because then it will become a very weak and, and um, um, weak line if I want to do that but when I when I just play with that mm -hmm. you know it becomes much much uh, more um, spontaneous spontaneous to to work with those and um, then uh, comes the the time to put the paint on somehow from the very very first paintings I did to the to today the very first color that I have used in these paintings is blue. You know, it's I, different shades of blue, turquoise, blue, 
the blue that you have at your uh, in the painting at the back and usually they are uh, they are different blues that come together and and if i want to to repeat the blue i have to be very careful about what i am doing how am i co combining these blues and sometimes it becomes quite challenging to remember what did i do how did i get this blue and then on top of that it's the uh, uh, the layering, which is also very interesting because uh, with the layering, you never really know what color will come out in the end. And you have to be, uh, you have to just be courageous and, and go with it and see what happens. And so, you know, with, with layering, it becomes much more ex uh, exciting. You have a very, very large palette, really, that you are creating as you go along. And uh, a lot of people have asked me about the very precise lines in these paintings, which, uh, uh, which come from my, my background in architecture. And somehow, um, even if I want to do a really free, free work, it's always uh, in the end. There's always this architecture, this this uh, this geometry, and um, it has two two parts for me. It sort of anchors the work, and also geometry is always for me something that relates to infinity and to, to, to the ideas of limitlessness, because you can, you can take a square and then grow it from both sides so that it can be, uh, go to infinity and it can go inside itself, you know, by, by, by just posing these uh, squares on top of each other. So there is always the idea of something beyond the painting. I achieve that through the geometries. For example, in the in the work behind you, there is a, this idea of of something going on beyond beyond this image. If you if you look at it, um, and of course, I use um, I do not use any spray painting or anything. It's always working with brushes and watercolor and water, but I do use um, the architectural the T square. Um, and uh, it which has an edge so it's sitting above the above the uh the paper and i wet the, the area that i want to work with either with water or with the paint and then i go with a very fine brush but guided with the t uh, t square um so that it becomes a line but it doesn't it doesn't stay as a line because it's wet on the other side and so it becomes a graduated color and so um, so that's uh, i mean with watercolor there is so many things that you can experiment with and discover as you work it's it's always like being in a class or in a but but you are the the medium is actually your teacher the medium <laughs> and the paper and the accidents that happen teach you this is how it happens and this is how you can continue learning thank you for that explanation pari uh as i say a number of our visitors have been very curious about the techniques behind the work in the exhibition thank i think you. this is probably a really good place to conclude our conversation this evening as much as I would love to keep talking. Uh, I know there's so much more that we could say. Uh, I'd like to thank you both for joining us this evening and, and talking about your work. Uh, we are very excited to have produced a publication for this project, uh, which has, <clears throat> which has me, excuse me, which has uh, two essays, one by Hussein Aminat about Pari's work and one by Astri Wright about Rosita's work. Uh, and that is of course available for purchase here at the Art Museum, uh, along with Pari's uh, publication uh, about which we spoke earlier, we have copies of that available for purchase as well. Uh, so I would invite uh, viewers, if you have not yet come in to see uh, the work in our exhibition under the shade of the lotus tree, please join us. We're open Tuesday to Saturdays from 11 till 5. 
uh, and this exhibition is on until April 1st. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Thank you so much, Ilari. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.